looks like uh, the boat is still uh, at the first of the still okay. And uh, the, the, the weather seems okay here. So, yeah, in a few minutes we'll be ready to pick up the uh, the over. Uh, I have to say that uh, you've been instructed by the MRCP to take my on board. And to pick up, to pick up the refugees, all the refugees over. Master, uh, okay, I'm just to uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just checking uh, my medical material as well in case we have CDF. Because we always know when we start, but we don't know when we finish. So. The, the weather is okay here, so yeah, in a few minutes we'll be ready to pick up the to be long so five hours rescue so we need may maybe some MSF people on the boat landing too. Uh, Laura in the shelter with the women if needed. Uh, Stefan's doing triage. We're ready to close the boats and, uh, and we will assess the situation from the bench. Okay, so. On board RIP2 we have a cultural mediator, so she will explain in French, English and Arabic uh, who we are, why we're here to help them. Usually in the first, uh, the first instance when they realize that they have a way out of the dangerous situation that they're in, the panic can then set in and they all of a sudden, they might have been on a boat for, for a couple of hours and the, the only thing they want is to be in a safe place. <laughs> They always have the danger of capsizing. So uh, if it capsizes, we already have like 200 people secured on the bananas. Just here, exactly where you are. There you go. Take care of them. We are lucky. The water was entering this uh, internal part of the boat, and you were pouring out out of the, the boat. Today the Aquarius assisted in the transfer of 119 people, 14 women and 6 children. Afterwards, the Maritime Rescue Coordination Center in Rome asked us to take on board 8 dead people that were left in one of the rubber boats that was rescued today. Uh, we got the 8 uh, people on board uh, and afterwards our medical doctor did an investigation. Uh, 
so what we think happened is that uh, the middle of the boat collapsed and people got uh, stuck in the middle and drowned in the water that was at the bottom of the boat. Doing rescues we basically find two uh, different types of boats. It's, one is the wooden boat which is basically a reused or normal constructed fishing boat and the other type is the uh, rubber boat which we can find to buy as a high quality migrant boat in the internet. Basically these boats are made for maybe 40-50 people and we find often three times that amount of people inside. The floor is just normal wooden plates. Uh, it can easily crack and then the boat kind of collapses. And this is basically due to the high weight of the uh, people because the boat is completely overloaded and not made for so many people. The rubber sponsons are made of different materials and it ranges from really, really bad, 0.5 millimeters, and it's still the only flotation which keeps 120 to 150 persons above the water. Once we've rescued a whole rubber boat, we drop the engine into the ocean. If we have wooden boats, we flag that there is an empty wooden boat and often there are assets like navy ships who come then and destroy the boat. Seven or ten days by work from Eritrea to Sudan. After that, they are, you pay some money, they get you Libya and they pay for the Saharan's money. in Eritrea, they must be soldiers after 11 school. A lot of things is very bad in Sudan. Uh, the medical care is very bad, no freedom of speech. If you talk about this, you will, you will detain and go to the prison. Everything in my country is very difficult. And I have a baby and I have a wife. Uh, I want him to uh, live good like other people. But in staying in uh, my country, I cannot do anything. At that time, our friends live in Khartoum. They said, why are you going to Libya? A lot of workers who can be rich. Generally, what happens is that uh, anyone coming from East or West Africa actually already makes contact with a smuggler or trafficker. They call them some Samsara. They get you Libya and they pay for the Saharan's money. These people are usually taken through the desert, uh, usually in vehicles, uh, in very difficult conditions with very minimal food and water. Even the driver tell us th the problem is not the police. He said to me there is malicious. If they find us, they say that I am Libyan, they're gonna kill me also. Some checkpoints, he knows them and he pays some money and then we we move. I met Daesh when I am going from uh, Kufra to Ijabia. They ask you about my religion and uh, they say to me uh, uh, read some uh, ayat from Quran, from Holy Quran. And I read it, and let's say, let me go. It's very difficult, it's very dangerous in the Sahara. In, in Libya, it's hard, it's difficult. Once they get to Libya, we hear a lot of stories about um, people being uh, abducted and or given a job and then having to be taken into detention centers. There is no enough food, there is no water, there, and there is stress, they hitting. They beat me so many, many, many times. And again, yeah, it's the beach and do it knife, everything. If all my body, if you show you, they beat me, they use knife, everything. We call it in Libya Tarkina, human store. 
We are actually in prison. No one can leave out these buildings. No one. A couple of other young boys from Dufour who were also um, miners, uh, they told us they also had been bought and sold several times. Their owner was purchasing guns in Libya in a, in a marketplace um, and had an argument with the man selling the weapon, whether the gun worked or not. And to prove that it worked, he uh, tested it on one of uh, the people that he owned. So one of the, the young boys they were with was shot um, and killed in front of them to, to show that this weapon worked. <laughs> Essentially, they're at the mercy of the prison guards um, who demand a constant flow of money, essentially, to um, release them. He gave me the phone, I called to mom, he was hit. There have been stories of people actually being shown to their relatives in Bangladesh on camera, being tortured and saying, if you do not send this money, your son or your nephew will be killed. Certain nationalities have a, a reputation for being more likely to pay up. And we've heard that Bangladeshis in Libya are considered to be walking money bags, essentially, uh, to put it bluntly, um, for different reasons. Uh, some of them being that they tend to have a very strong sense of collective identity and that they stick together. So if one of them gets hurt, all of them will essentially feel that same pain and uh, want to do anything to help the other get out of the situation. These are people that have come to Libya for work and the only way out for them actually is the sea. Um, so for many of them, Europe wasn't an initial plan. It is just the only way uh, to get out of Libya at some point. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. Someone got me there. To the side, he said, if you're looking for a trip, I can get you one, but it's, it's, well, it it's will be expensive. I asked him how, how much expensive he said, like one, uh, like 1500, you know. The next day, he called me, he says, All right, someone will come and pick the money up. There is a very big camp uh, near, the, near the sea, uh, there is smugglers. And I asked about this, he said to me, He's, uh, he's an officer, he has a rank, high rank in. Libyan, in Libyan army. This is his shoes. He has cars and has uh, artillery, I mean heavy guns. His name was Said. They get on the boats. There are even encounters with different, what they call Libyan mafias. Uh, they're in charge of taking certain belongings from them. So I've heard stories about one boat being uh, approached by four different Libyan boats that claim to be the Libyan Coast Guard. And one of them will demand everybody's cell phone, uh, money. And then there have even been stories of uh, certain boats coming up and demanding all of the women. I, I remember there is a guy from Nigeria. They put him in a boat and he jumped out. Uh, I, uh, I said to him, why you jump out? You don't know from Nigeria there. You're going to cross the sea. He said to me, there is a guy from Nigeria there, cheated me. He said to me, you go to Tripoli, and from Tripoli you cross to Italia with a train. So when I saw this scene, uh, I had been shocked. Most people are absolutely shocked when they find out from us uh, what our ETA is in Italy. Um, they think that the trip is significantly shorter than it is even on our ship. I have heard people say that the Mediterranean Sea is a river. I know about the journey that uh, in uh, six, seven hours, we will arrive to the international uh, water, okay? And we will seek for, seek for the rescue. Rescue by, by you? Uh, Italian army. And from there, they took you to Italy, not, not, not far. Uh, only hours you, you get to, to eat it. Which of course is absolutely false. Um, as you know, you know, from our ship here on the Aquarius with our motors, um, it, it, it can take you know, at least 24 hours. So often I, I ask people uh, 
what they want to happen now once they reach Italy, what are they hoping for. Um, and it's always quite a simple answer. Usually people tell me um, they just want life, they just want an opportunity to, to live and, and to work. After a rescue, I try not to think too much about everything while I'm here, uh, otherwise I think it becomes overwhelming. The, the misery that we see on a daily basis doing rescues and post-rescue as well with the stories that we hear from people, uh, a lot of the stories are atrocious and you really have to kind of build up a barrier um, in order to be able to get through that and continue doing this work uh, for a long period of time. The amount of people that have, have been saved due to our presence here um, is something that we should be very proud of as a team and, and think about the amount of people that would have died if we hadn't been there in that situation and hadn't saved that boat. in front of the Libyan coast, and we advise you to leave the SAR area because you're acting as a pull factor for human traffickers, making them billions. We will watch you and the days of your unwatched doings here are over. This is the shocking truth behind the Syrian refugee crisis that has been hidden from the public. The migrants pay people smugglers 1500 euros each. They're not destitute refugees. The people smugglers then transport the migrants to a position just 12 miles off the coast of Libya. Just 12 miles. They then send out a distress call and the migrants are picked up by EU and NGO vessels. It's literally a taxi service straight to Europe. Yeah, the idea that we're a taxi service is, is pretty absurd. Um, people uh, call for a taxi when you know, they're leaving the house and they're doing something in their everyday life. People here are fleeing uh, from conflict and, and persecution. They're leaving the Libyan coast in unseaworthy boats. As with everything, it's uh, the MRCC, the Maritime Rescue Coordination Center in Rome, that then directs us. So uh, in any place where we do a rescue, it's always under coordination of the MRCC. There's reason to suspect that the people smugglers are actually in direct contact with aid agencies, which is why they're so often first on the scene to rescue migrant boats. No one's calling us. We're on patrol here. Uh, we're constantly doing lookout, uh, looking for these boats that are in distress. Uh, we go in there as a floating ambulance, rescue them from their boats, and then hand them over to the medics on board. It's a call that we receive by the MRCC that gives us uh, the position of a boat in distress and so we proceed to this position and uh, again we, can, we, we carry out the rescue in uh, full coordination with them. The law states that the refugees should be taken to the nearest safe port, which would be Tunisia. But these NGOs are taking them straight to Italy. As you can see in this marinetraffic.com illustration, the NGO boats are leaving Italy, travelling to right off the coast of Libya, just off the coast, then returning to Italy with their human cargo. The MRCC, uh, the Italian government, uh, and also us, we, we do not consider any port in Libya as a port of safety. Uh, the SAR Convention, the search and rescue rules uh, on all seven seas of the world, states that if you rescue somebody at sea, you have to bring them to a place of safety that's safe for them. And so, uh, to us, uh, Libya isn't that, the Italian government agrees, which is why we will be directed to take people to Italy and not to Libya. Just being a rescue ship doesn't mean 
that you just travel around with migraines. It just means you prevent people from dying. And this is the basic job. And if someone would say this is a taxi, uh, then I just can say sorry for that because I'm here to rescue people because I don't want people to die to come to a place where I'm living, where I had the right to grow up.